welcome. We are back here on one of our other interviews that we've been doing recently. And today we're joined by Michael Ojibwe from Invisible Choir. Hey, Mike, thanks for joining us. How's it going? Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, good to chat. And uh, hopefully we have a great discussion here tonight. Yeah, yeah, we for sure. We for sure will. We'll, uh, we'll kind of get into some things and uh, get to know you a little better and uh, hopefully get some of our viewers uh, also listening to your your podcast because we both think that it's uh it's my favorite true crime podcast yeah, so. it, it's an incredible podcast oh, thank you appreciate I'm not that. just blowing smoke it actually is my favorite one so it's an honor to have you here well, i sincerely appreciate the the opportunity for sure yeah no problem yeah i think uh having sort of crossover with content creators is a really good idea um just in general to get people uh, listening to a lot of different perspectives from a lot of different people from different backgrounds so i guess yeah with that being said we can kind of just uh jump into some questions and then sort of converse on them as we see um as we see fit so sure. tell us about what made you want to start invisible choir just in general yeah so invisible choir has actually existed in a couple of different planes you know so i kind of had the original invisible choir which i started working on probably in 2017 um, into 2018. Not a lot of people are aware of this, but when I originally started Invisible Choir, the concept, the branding, everything was built around cases of missing and murdered indigenous women. Yeah. So I had a very particular focus rooted in these cases that were, you know, largely systemically under investigated, under resourced, mm -hmm. um, involving these uh, indigenous women. Uh, who had either gone missing or, or had been murdered, uh, generally in these more traditional reservation communities or First Nations communities. But so that's where it started for me, you know, why I wanted to do it. At the time, I was commuting about 90 minutes each way to work. I was driving from Western Wisconsin to the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Wow. Uh, to and from every day at a new position working in the higher education in St. Paul, uh, right downtown. And, uh, originally I, you know, I was listening to music, but I would just start, I'd fall asleep by the end of the day. I'd be driving that long 90 minute drive back home. I just started dozing off. And, uh, my then girlfriend who is now my wife, um, I don't know if she was the one who made the, the suggestion or somebody that I was working with is like, Oh my gosh, if you listen to podcasts, and so, of course, they said, you got to listen to Serial. Serial is this amazing podcast, which, you know, Serial broke the mold and, and got a lot of people into listening to podcasts, which it did for me. Mm -hmm. um, and something happened during that ride. Um, you know, hour and a half drive felt like it took 10 minutes. I mean, I was driving through some very rural wooded land to get to the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. And it just felt like it, it, it just went so quickly because I became so emotionally invested uh, in these different cases, different stories. And originally it was serial, but then I just started running searches and found that for me, you know, I've always been fascinated by crime, uh, you know, since some, my days in graduate school, um, I used to share, I was in a cubicle farm with a, a criminologist, a, a, a student who was in the uh, sociology PhD program that I was in. Uh, he was, his emphasis was criminology. And I just, I was always working on educational stuff, higher education stuff. And uh, I would always go talk to him because he had the really interesting stuff. I mean, he, you know, so I spent a lot of time picking this guy's brain and it got to the point for me where I wasn't hearing those stories of missing and murdered indigenous women across all these different podcasts that I would listen to um, several true crime podcasts. And, um, you know, eventually for me, I started obviously Invisible Choir, which was originally kind of a play on invisible no more which is kind of the rallying cry of missing and murdered indigenous yeah. women and, and the movement to bring more visibility to a problem mm -hmm. which has sort of largely been rendered invisible uh, but also uh, a poem a george Eliot, uh, which was marianne cross's pseudonym mm -hmm. a poem called the choir invisible mm -hmm. which is there's it's a metaphorical concept of when when one joins the so-called choir invisible they die you know they become part of this choir of invisible voices, right? That the right. legacy of the, of the voice lives on, the body dies. And so I, you know, I came up with invisible choir 
really originally the concept was we were we were really going to work to bring visibility to stories and cases that were otherwise largely ignored by traditional media big media and um and we did so in, the, in its initial iteration uh i spent a lot of time interviewing family members you know one of the mm -hmm. first cases i covered was uh ashley loring heavy runner indigenous woman who mysteriously vanished um, and her sister Kimberly has just been waging a war, a battle to find her sister. Yeah. And she's, she's still missing. Um, it actually up and vanished. I think Payne Lindsay in season three just covered this, this case. Um, and so it's been interesting to hear his take and he's gone into the community and, and spoken to people. And, um, you know, I, I got to meet some really incredible people and, uh, I learned a lot about, you know, I'd had some graduate work in ethnographic field work and interviewing and things like that. But until you're actually sitting down with someone who's lost a loved one or whose loved one has been, you know, tragically murdered or in, in some cases, some really horrific ways, all of that traditional training kind of goes out the window. And so for me, that's what Invisible Choir represented in its in, in, uh, initial form. Um man, then I changed jobs and, and, uh, invisible choir just went away for like a year and a half. Um, yeah. at, at that time I, I, uh, I changed uh, career, um, industries. I went from working a career in higher education administration to, uh, working in the uh, state department of corrections in the prison system. And, um, you know, I've always worked peripheral to legal in terms of, uh, equal opportunity, discrimination <laughs> harassment and other misconduct investigations yeah uh, so when yeah. i went to when i went to work for the prison system i oversaw you know staff recruitment efforts i oversaw uh, a large portion of uh eo related training a lot of staff training sexual harassment things of that nature but i also oversaw the workplace um discrimination harassment sexual misconduct uh, and the ada title ii investigation so a lot of that work brought me out into the facilities, um, you know, into Minnesota's 10 prison system, uh, or excuse me, 10 um, correctional facilities or prisons, as people call them. And so for me, it was just, it was a better fit. You know, I've always been very fascinated by uh, criminogenic behavior and thinking. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it, it brought me very close to the individuals who have been adjudicated through the court system and, uh, you know, gave me many opportunities to, to speak and interact with people who have committed some horrific, horrific crimes. Um, and, and some of these, some of these men and women, you, you wouldn't know it. Others you would by talking to them. And, um, yeah, I have a tendency, by the way, to just talk and talk and talk. It's so okay. No, it's no, okay. it's great. It gives, us, gives us a lot of, uh, a lot of things to to kind of put out there, uh, I'm sure that a lot of our viewers will be interested in knowing about these things. And, uh, you know, I know quite a few people that listen to your podcast. So, uh, you know, this is, this is important to us and, and important to a lot of listeners. So did, um, just as a question based off of what you were just talking about, did you switch career paths? Was it just because of the opportunity or was it something that you sort of, you, you wanted to do initially? Like, was there like, was, was that the motivation? Was it just something because it was, you, you were interested in it? Uh, I mean, I had, I had worked in uh, Minnesota state government previously. So part of it was, you know, part of it was a very natural transition, you know, still right. working in state government in that capacity. Uh, the other part of it was there were some things happening in higher education. Uh, at the time, uh, when I left my last position, I was an associate dean of student success and uh, oversaw student advising, student success, and counseling. And, uh, you know, there's been some system-wide changes in, in higher education that um, I really worked to try to change. Yeah. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not someone who stays on the treadmill and gets holistically and completely burnt out. Uh, you know, if I, my contributions are not uh, being implemented to the degree that they could be, you know, I move on. I'm not someone who uh, spends a, a career somewhere uh, miserable. I never have been. I never will be. Right. And uh, and so I left. I made a conscious decision to leave. And uh, this position came available. So I reached out to a few contacts and uh, who I knew working in that equal opportunity space. And uh, they all warned me, do not go there. 
do not go to the Department of Corrections. Uh, I'm no longer employed there, so I'll speak freely and openly about this stuff now. Sure. But uh, there was a time when I would not. But, uh, you know, one of the first things I found out was that they were being sued constantly. Offenders within the system, individuals who are incarcerated are uh, notoriously litigious. Uh, many of them are, you know, when you've got nothing but time, you become very legally adept. Yeah. And there's a lot of people within the prison system who are filing litigation to one degree or another. Some of it, and, and part of my position was navigating, <clears throat> you know, very um, uh, meaningful litigation. Other parts of it was, uh, you know, stuff that was just completely off the wall. There's a lot of misuse. Uh, they're they're kind of uh, create. They're going by the loopholes and they're using legal loopholes to kind of try to get themselves uh, pleased and things like that. Probably. Yeah. The other thing that happens is there. There's a lot of litigation that people file just simply to create busy work or to create a blockade of uh, an administrative yeah. blockade to to bring the bureaucracy to a grinding halt. Uh, and and we saw that a lot, unfortunately. But they also have legislation to. Uh, you know, to crack down on that so that yeah. individuals aren't filing, uh, you know, baseless uh, lawsuits all the time. Right. But that was my foray. You know, the first day I came into the prison system, I was sat down and said, OK, we have a lot of stuff going very wrong here that mm -hmm. falls under your purview. And uh, and for the first week or so, I had a series of people coming in and laying that out for me. And uh, it was a big job, a really big job. And uh yeah, we could talk about that all day, every day, but it, I would love to answer specific questions, but man, I'll go on all day about that. Uh, <laughs> at some point while I'm working in the prison system, uh, a former Wondery, a, a former Wondery true crime podcast, mm -hmm. big time show <clears throat> posted for a writer producer position. <clears throat> I applied, uh, I got the position. And so while I'm working for the prison system, simultaneously, uh, I got clearance to be able to write and produce for this true crime podcast. Was it a, was it sword and scale? It was, I will okay. not say that the, I will not say the name of that show, uh, for a variety of reasons. I will not give credence to it. I can I edit there. that out too. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just, I was there for a very little time. There, uh, people have built up a, a tremendous amount of mystique that I, man, when, when this show was, was really good. Mike Ojibwe was writing for it. I wasn't. I was there for a very small percentage of the time uh, right before they got dropped from Wondery. So, um, but I got my, you know, I sort of got my proverbial whistle wet a little bit and, and found out that I really loved the writing and production in, in true crime podcasting. Yeah. And so that led to, you know, after I, and the creator of that show makes up all kinds of baseless lies about uh, he fired me. He didn't fire me. I left. Uh, the guy offered to pay me a ridiculous amount of money. I never once demanded money. Um, I asked for certain assurances because he wanted me to leave my job and the stability of a retirement plan and everything else right. to become an independent contractor full time. And I just I couldn't do it at the time. I wasn't committed at that level. And so I eventually made the decision to leave just more for for ethical and moral uh, reasons. And uh, others, have, uh, people have said in the past that I always try to elevate myself. I haven't, I worked for, I worked for that asshole. I'll say it. I worked for the asshole. I love the team behind the scenes that a really smooth production, uh, but the guy leading it was just a dick and uh, you can leave that in. I think he needs to yeah. do that occasionally. As soon as they're, uh, they're starting in with their, the legalities of being a private, uh, you know, someone, a private contracted employee, uh, you know, it's kind of putting all the risk on, on that individual and none on yeah. the company and it's a pretty shady business. So, Agreed. yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it is pretty standard, I think to, uh, yeah. to employ sure independent contractors, but, but, but if you're wanting someone to lead your entire production, it's an, it's right. a salaried employment position, you know, it, it becomes, right. that, but so anyways, you know, I made a decision that was March of 2019. I made a decision and I began studying, deeply studying um, every night and on the weekends, audio engineering, marketing, promotion between March uh, and eventually when I launched, relaunched Invis Invisible Choir, uh, July of 2019. Um, so I made a conscious decision to relaunch, to take on a broader scope with the show. 
And, um, and that's how we sort of got started in the vein of invisible choir that people know and listen to today. Yeah. It's a much broader show. I remember. So I found invisible choir actually during the pandemic. I, I hadn't heard of you. And I, I think a friend of mine had recommended your podcast and i you know, at the time had all the time in the world. So I was just trying out different podcasts and seeing what I liked because I was sort of sticking to the same kind of few and I wanted to branch out. But I remember specifically what I had mentioned to you when we were talking the other day about the Miss Debbie episode. I remember where I was when I heard that. And it was a sunny day and I was outside and it was it was summer and I had just gotten like in my kiddie pool and I was having like this like wonderful sunny afternoon. And I heard that podcast episode and I had to get out and sit there and just be with my thoughts for a minute because I I am pretty desensitized to certain things. Um, right. I think sound affects me a lot more than visuals. And just a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. There's a reason for that. Those yeah. 911 calls with that woman, it, it destroyed me. It absolutely destroyed me. And it made me so incredibly sad in a way that no other sort of auditory podcast listening experience ever has. Yeah, that was a that's a horrible situation. It it absolutely ru- I mean I mean I mean this as a testament to you but it ruined my day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, but right. It, it it has lasted it it's it's a long lasting effect that that had. And and it's important to hear those things I think, you know, to uh kind of give voice to these uh these sort of injustices that end up occurring uh you know it was just a horrible situation preventable yeah absolutely preventable and just yeah that man that case is that that one is just really unfortunate for a variety of reasons but i think your experience is is common with that one you know i took a calculated risk and and we do this we do this with every single episode we publish you know anytime Mm -hmm. we filed requests or obtained publicly accessible data, in this case, the 911 calls, the full 911 calls uh, that I hadn't yet heard fully published. But part of the the original mission of Invisible Choir was, again, sort of bringing voice to the voiceless. When, yeah. when someone like Debbie Stevens dies a horrific death, being mocked and goaded and, yep. uh, and, and effectively verbally harassed yep. by a... a a public official working in that 911 dispatcher capacity who if i remember correctly was wrapping up, up her last shift it was before, her last shift before moving on and there's something about audio and you mentioned this that audio just affects you differently it audio affects most people i would venture differently for a very specific reason and this is why i really love the podcasting medium and that is when you are you know, when you put a set of headphones on or you're sitting in the car and you're tuning in to the audio only, it forces your other senses to heighten. Mm-hmm. So your your capacity to visualize what someone might be going through is heightened beyond you just sitting there. Your your imagination yes. is brought to a new level of lucidity and, and allows you to visualize things differently than if you did not have audio, which is why we do include so much primary source audio. It's to bring a listener to a different level in depth of emotional investment right. beyond just uh, the narrator speaking and telling a quote unquote story. These aren't stories. These are real life cases. Most every one of them representative of someone's horrific last day on earth. Uh, the worst day of their life, the worst day of the lives of their family members. You know, the ripple effect extends. And in this case in particular, you know, I did. I, I believe that I also included, if I remember correctly, kind of a layered trigger warning specifically. And I've never done that before, except for this one where I just reminded the listener, we're about to venture into the last moments of this woman's life. Mm-hmm. You're about to hear some really um, difficult to listen to audio. And, uh, in, and I hope that I set that up well enough that I didn't unnecessarily traumatize people because I have listened to podcasts, the one we were just talking about that I worked at included where I was just unnecessarily traumatized, uh, 
there was a two part Luca Magnata episode that this no. podcast did. And uh, he was pulling at all sorts of peripheral gore, video, audio, right. um, and uh, played some really horrific agonal breathing of an individual whose head had just been beaten in with a hammer, you know, really horrific stuff. Caught the listener off guard, myself included. That was me, like you just described. That was me pulling into work in the parking ramp downtown St. Paul. And uh, I had to sit there for like 15, 20 minutes and just decompress. I was in a weird mental state after that one. And uh, so I always tried to set the listener up differently, you know, and at yeah. least at least give a layered trigger warning for cases like that. And I've been asked before. I'm, I was the victim of a, of a violent crime one time myself what I want everything published and, and turned into a, you know, dramatized true crime podcast. Maybe if, if they reached out, you know, and, and uh, offered to connect, um, but maybe not. It's a really, it's a man, there's a, it's a double-edged sword. And I've been there the is. first to be, uh, some folks have said that I, I elevate myself to a moral high ground. I do not. I, I fully realize the depths at which we all operate when mm -hmm. we're engaging in this type of true crime media. It's a really difficult space. Yeah. In a lot of ways, it sort of represents the wild, wild west of new media because it's largely unregulated. There are so many shows pulling illegally from copywritten materials, illegally from leaked materials, like you said, who have little to no understanding of the court adjudication system, the value of those pretrial uh, conferences and hearings, et cetera, uh, and want to be in their eyes, the first to quote unquote crack or, or break a story. Um, and we don't, you know, we don't take that path. We're very meticulous in our checklist. I mean, it's like an air, you know, it's like the airline pilots running a checklist before takeoff and landing. We have a very meticulous structure, a structure that I developed and implemented at another show I once worked at, if you can believe it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I take full credit for creating some of those checks and balances, uh, and I'll continue to do that because others have lied, uh, peripheral yeah. folks involved in this show. Um, and so I'll take credit where I've put the work in to create those standards. And that was why I was offered that production management job. And ultimately, uh, I chose to leave and uh, deploy those structures in a new show called Invisible Choir. Yeah. And back to what you were saying about... Um, <clears throat> like unnecessarily traumatizing people and you know you have never not warned people as far as i know like every podcast that i've listened to that you've done you've been very thorough about trigger warnings and what you're about to get yourself into and i i sincerely appreciate that because i can't tell you the amount of episodes of different podcasts that i've listened to that maybe haven't said something like there's an animal cruelty yeah, uh, right. stuff that's talked right. about in the episode. And that's then hard I, for me to watch too. And then I listen to listen it to and it. I'm I'm just like, why didn't you warn anybody? Like this is all like, and then it, you know, affects your mental state like very negatively. But you know, you've and you know, I, I signed up for your your top tier, so I I get all of your material. So I know what I'm getting myself into with everything that you post. Um, yeah, so you get into the dark stuff. Yeah, yeah, but and that's originally how we met is because one of your one of your uncensored episodes. So, but you're yeah, you've you've done a very good job at um, sort of setting the bar for what's you know what's expected of podcast hosts in terms of content warning and just being extremely respectful to the um, the individuals that the episodes are about and also your listeners too. So that's very very much appreciated. Oh, I appreciate um, the feedback for sure. Yeah. With that being said, um, what, like, what in your opinion is one, you don't have to say the most memorable case, but what is one of the most memorable cases that you've covered? And like, what, what is the reason for that? You know, I think there are a couple, you know, I think the one that always comes back and sort of haunts me a little bit is the Savannah LaFontaine gray wind case um for a couple of reasons that i had first heard about that horrific murder savannah lafontaine gray when was eight months pregnant when she went missing uh she was at her parents apartment ventured upstairs to help her upstairs neighbor with a allegedly with a sewing project she offered her help you know to i think to help with this project or try something on for her upstairs neighbor not knowing that her upstairs neighbor was 
severely and persistently mentally ill. There's a documentable history of that. And that she is obsessively wanting a newborn child. And for whatever reason is unable to um, bring her own into the world with her at the time boyfriend. Um, and, you know, I don't know if we're, you want me to go into specific detail? It's really, it's a really horrific case. And for the, sure, I think, sure, yeah. yeah, whenever, whenever you're whenever, comfortable whenever with, whatever you're comfortable with. Right. So this case has a couple of elements that just really haunt me. And I, and I think the most memorable in terms of just the, the horror motherhood in indigenous cultures is something so sacred. The, the matriarchy is so elevated and valued in indigenous cultures most um, that uh, most people would, you know, could you could read an article about it, but you would never fully understand what it's like to seek counsel from the grandmothers in certain tribes or different bands of tribes or, or to fully understand the, the sacred bond between mother and child and, and the process and act of giving birth, for instance, and how sacred that is and how certain ceremonial things depending upon the tribe need to happen you know for that child to come into the world in a good way in a blessed way and so you know she goes missing savannah lafontaine graywin goes missing uh, police search the upstairs apartment i believe four separate times mm -hmm. each time they find nothing and then uh, all of a sudden, sometime later, a kayaker is uh, rolling down the Red River and comes across a body that's wrapped in plastic and, and, and taped up. It's Savannah LaFontaine Graywin's body. And uh, the baby has been, you know, cut from her stomach. Wow. And, uh, and the upstairs neighbor did that in the upstairs apartment while her mother was down below. Really horrific case. Horrific for a, a number of reasons. Number one, those upstairs neighbors, um, Brooke Cruz and, and uh, Hayne, I forget Hayne's first name, Terry Hayne, maybe I forget. I'd have to look. It's been, it's been a number of years now, but that case in particular, really horrifying because the Fargo police allegedly had this couple on 24 hour surveillance. Oh my God. Knowing, wow. knowing that something just wasn't right. They'd been in the apartment for voluntary searches mm -hmm. up to that point two times. What had happened was, you know, yeah. had, Savannah had been attacked in the bathroom, I believe. Her baby um, was just horrifically cut from the womb. Um, Savannah died a really tragic death. They hid Savannah's body originally in a in a pop out space in a closet, if I'm not mistaken, that was attached to the bathroom or a room in the in the bathroom, and then eventually moved her body into. Um, the boyfriend hollowed out a dresser you know he basically wow. took the drawers out glued yeah. the glued the drawers on the front hollowed the dresser out and left her body in there meanwhile each time the police come in to search this apartment they they've got the baby laying on their bed covered with the with the comforter and for whatever reason that baby is alive obviously survived yeah. and uh was quiet and the police did not find that baby now, mind you, a voluntary search of that nature is not an invasive warranted right. search where they're tearing the property apart. Right. Generally, law enforcement is very respectful, but you, but, but you have to be observant. You have to be observant. I've been very critical of the Fargo police in that incident uh, and the family. I can't speak for the family. I, I've been made aware of some things that folks are not happy with regarding how the police handled that case. Number one. If that couple was uh, truly under 24 hour surveillance, when uh, these two individuals carried that really heavy dresser with Savannah's body in it down the stairs and out they into there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. They should have, they should have seen it. I mean, granted it did occur between the hours of two and four o'clock in the morning. They drove up the road and they lifted this heavy dresser up over a, a bridge railing and uh, dumped it in the red river wow. for this, for this kayaker to find. And so, you know, there's a trail of evidence, you know, Brooklyn Cruz, I think I'm pretty sure is her name, uh, took this baby to Walmart and there she is on camera buying the baby diapers and formula and other stuff. Really horrifying stuff, how someone can just murder someone, violate that sacred bond of motherhood and yes. have no idea what it represents to this indigenous family. Mm -hmm. 
and and all that they've compromised by doing so and then to uh, to go to walmart and, and pick up a little similac and some diapers and carry on about your day that in my opinion is just one of the more horrific cases and it's the one that motivated me to start invisible choir um because I had uh, some family who brought that case to my attention first because uh, my cousin's wife is, is from that area, uh, kind of that turtle mountain region. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, they had heard about this because it was, you know, it was talked about in the community when they first found out what was happening. Right. And um, man, it just, that one just, it, it's really a horrific, unfortunate, scary, tragic i can't even come up with enough descriptors for that one because during that first second search you know they should have smelled the the uh strong cleaners that were used in the bathroom absolutely oh god it's, yeah. it's a it's a terrifically messy endeavor to uh effectively do a home c-section of that nature and i apologize if that's really offensive to folks no but I, Un unfortunately, uh, with a lot of these cases, there there seems to be, you know, hindsight's usually twenty twenty. Uh, but it's after all the damage has already occurred. Uh, people have been further victimized, or uh, you know, these perpetrators have gone long amounts of time kind of getting away with this. And uh, yeah, it's it's really important to draw attention to these cases because uh, I think the collateral damage is important for, for listeners and viewers to, to know about. Um, you know, oftentimes we see these names, we see the, the name of the killer, we see the names of the victims, but uh, we don't really think about how, how the course of the investigation affected the families. People should um, be held accountable if they make mistakes yeah. like that yeah, in, in some form, you know, whether that's, you know, within their own sort of jurisdiction, or at least, you know, having the public be aware of stuff like this actually happening, because yeah. you can't just go about thinking everything sunshine and rainbows with law enforcement all the time. A lot time. of time, law enforcement doesn't want to work with the public, or they, they sort of gatekeep, and, and that also prevents uh, information getting to them to resolve these <clears throat> types of investigations properly, so. Yeah, and it's a, you know, I don't want to just, you know, crap all over law enforcement no. I, worked, I worked peripherally yeah in, in conjunction with law enforcement you know for a time what i'm saying is in a, in a case like this you you have what i refer to uh, as several missed opportunities right and and what i what i really struggle to understand fully is when you've got a chief of police who's going out of his way at the press conference or on social media to say we've got this under control We've got folks under 24 hour surveillance. We will find out what happened. And they did, but it's kind of the age old scenario where, uh, you know, a body surfaces organically to someone navigating the area, yeah. the environment, the nature. Um, one of the messages I had received from a representative of Savannah's family after I published the episode was that her parents after she went missing, they just like felt this urge. I'm getting chills just thinking about this. Like they, they told me that the parents like <clears throat> felt this draw to the red river, to the water. The title of that episode <laughs> is called water is life. Water is sacred. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's another yeah. sacred element of an indigenous culture. And, and so the ending of that episode is just, it, it, it uh, I brought it out to the sound of water. You know, there's a building uh, music line, as I'm wrapping up the case and you hear the river getting louder and louder until it drowns out my voice, until it drowns out the music, until it drowns out everything. And that's representative of how sacred water is, you know, and, and for her to have sort of ended up there and for her parents to have felt that draw, there was something sacred of, of a, of a sacred order occurring there. Um, I think. And that's something else that I really like about invisible choir. And you sort of mention it in the opening um, of the podcast and how you say it's like an auditory experience you definitely put this sort of it's I don't want to say like it's atmospheric it's not theatrical it like it almost is like the things that you add to the podcast make you feel like you being the listener you're just completely consumed by what you're saying almost like you're in you know like an IMAX movie theater or something yeah. it feels it feels like an old radio uh, you used to hear 
um, you know, back before television and stuff, they would tell stories uh, and people would just sit next to the radio and kind of use their imagination. And television and right. internet has kind of, you know, gotten rid of that aspect uh, sort of, but I, I find with your podcast, uh, you know, you have a good soothing voice and, and you're very clinical, uh, but the information that, uh, that you give is, uh, is always well founded, and and we can always appreciate things like that. So yeah, I, I man, I appreciate the feedback, and it and it really is nice to hear that because we, I mean, that's part of what we aim to do, and and to do yeah. so a little bit differently for sure. Uh, when it comes to some of these perpetrators, uh, these horrible crimes, uh, do you believe that they're inherently evil, uh, or or is this just? Uh, you know, happenstance that kind of puts them in this bad position. And like what what things if what things about their life and their environment do you think contribute the most towards what they ultimately become? Just from your own personal standpoint and also being involved with corrections and getting to talk to some of these people one yeah. on one. Right. I mean, I don't personally believe in the the idea that uh, certain people are sort of quote unquote in, inherently evil. I think it's uh I don't mean to be hypercritical of that terminology, but but to me, it's that's kind of a shortcut cop out. On yeah, well, probably you're right. I mean, it, it's to say someone is inherently evil. I think is a is a very simplified way of saying there probably was a very complicated, layered yes yeah. history leading Quilt up to whatever things. happened. Right, a, a tapestry of trauma and crime and and victimization both ways that probably led to that individual doing so. And in conjunction, a lot of times with, uh, you know, uh, delusions connected to mental illness. And I think, right. you know, we, and we're very intentional in our show about examining mental illness in a way that we're not projecting or promoting that anyone and everyone who's quote unquote mentally ill or carries a diagnosis of, of mental illness to one degree or another is somehow inherently dangerous. Right. You know, most of us navigating the space know that individuals suffering from mental illness or mental health crises uh, generally are more statistically likely to, to become victims of violent crime, not perpetrators of violent crime. And, uh, you know, I think, what are things of, of an individual's life that may lead them to perpetrate some of these horrible things? Um, you know, I think of, uh, I used to go out and, and do trainings to field agents uh, in the Department of Corrections. These are men and women who are working with offenders who have served two thirds of their sentence, in this case, in the state of Minnesota. They've been, you know, if they had good behavior, et cetera, they were uh, released. Um, for that last third on, on what's called supervised release. And so these are men and women who are going out, conducting visits with people who have served a, a great deal of time for homicide or, or, or what have you. And so I did a lot of training on, and within these uh, folks serving tribal communities, talking about things like uh, intergenerational or historical trauma. Right. And uh, and how to effectively navigate some very difficult terrain, specifically in Indian country and in some of these reservation communities where, for instance, um, native gangs and hybrid gangs, uh, indigenous gangs are some of the most uh, horrifically brutal uh, and organized, I should say, and how they conduct themselves and, and how they initiate and facilitate and sustain membership, including within the prisons, some horrific things. I've just seen some horrific things um, in that capacity. But part of what I talked about in these trainings was, you know, there's a, there's a variety of different things. You know, there are a variety of different things impacting different populations. Uh, when, you, when you combine, in, in many cases, uh, you know, pervasive poverty, yeah. uh, when an individual's sort of uh, general life needs are not being met from a very young age, one of uh, two things happens. Um, you know, that individual becomes victimized to the larger system and maybe they don't survive, right? It could be a starvation. It could, you know, it could be homelessness. It could be malnutrition. It could be uh, poor health gone untreated, et cetera. Yeah. It could go a different path uh, for a lot of these young uh, boys and girls and young men and women, you know, they find solace in gangs. This is just one example, but 
the idea that you know if, if the traditional fam family structure isn't in place they'll sort of find it elsewhere where it's being provided within some of these indigenous communities when you've got yeah. histories of indian boarding schools basically eradicating um parenting skills through very horrific traumas sexual abuse uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, some of the things going on in Canada. They recently found that there were some uh, some like native schools where mm -hmm. children were going missing. And for the last century, uh, right. the government was covering it up, uh, covering yeah. up the deaths and burials of uh, these mass graves. And uh, so I understand completely what you're talking about. It's uh, yeah. And so. What many people don't realize is, and you know, up until as late as 1998, Indian yep. boarding schools were fully permissible in this country, the United States of America, which means children today are possibly, you know, only one, one, possibly two generations removed from one of the most horrific mass genocides the country has ever yes. seen. And it happened not only in plain sight, the results were sort of swept under the consciousness of the American rug. Uh, and, and like you said, and they do, they have a, there are groups out there right now in the U S with ground penetrating radar, searching for similar, uh, mass yep. graves of, of indigenous children who were buried, uh, in, in unmarked graves or in mass graves. And, um, yeah, I forgot where we going with that, but, uh, inherently evil. I don't know. Maybe the people who created Indian boarding schools, maybe I could believe in it then, but, uh, yeah. you know, even there, there's a, there's a whole layered history often of personal trauma, personal victimization, uh, exposure to violent crime. Um, not always. In some cases, someone has a really great life. And for whatever reason, there may be, you know, some type of uh, escalating mental health crisis. And one of the things that's not talked about enough, I think, are when an individual has delusions and if the delusions become so real and so obsessively all consuming to that individual, sometimes something very unique happens. And that is, you'll hear cases where someone thought or believed, you know, it could have been a schizoaffective disorder or something else where there were not only hallucinations and delusions of grandeur and other types of delusions, uh, but also sort of hearing voices and uh, yeah. the voices may be telling them, look, you need to kill your own brother to save humanity. Yeah. And there's some really unfortunate cases where, you know, an individual may well believe or get to the point of believing that they need to commit a horrific crime, you know, at the, at the expense of a close friend or loved one to save the rest of the family or to save humanity. Oftentimes they're layered with biblical, uh, you know, biblical uh, meaning and things like that but man these things are so layered i think it yeah. for most it's just a really complicated layering of things that likely led up to someone committing a horrific crime and i i would never generalize and say i think it's these three things right you know? yeah, yeah i agree i agree i think I agree. it's like the a little bit of exposure that your brain gets to those thoughts over a course of time i think it's if you're sort of casually weaning yourself onto these thoughts and having them more often and you sort of let them in that you know not saying that you choose to necessarily if you have a mental mental illness but a little bit of exposure your brain gets to these to these delusions a little bit at a time and then your reference level eventually becomes that that delusion you know well that's and exactly it, what happens yeah and then it know. only kind of gets worse from it's there just like it's just like abuse situations uh you know a lot of times these children um, are born into these horrific households and they don't even really realize uh, until they're coming of age that they, you know, have been traumatized their entire life and, and their norm uh, doesn't really occupy the norm of, of many of the people around them. And, uh, you know, that kind of sets them up for failure later on in life uh, if they don't get a grip on it early on. And, uh, and then there's cases that are kind of totally seemingly out of that whole realm of what we've been talking about where it's like that one episode that you did about um i think it was a he's kind of a teenager young adult man in canada that uh took mushrooms and then went and stabbed his father oh, yeah yeah and, yeah and his i think his stepmom that was right. terrifying with the other thing i was going to mention is 
oftentimes, not always, obviously, it's this layered, complicated web of, of variables leading to a situation. The other one that I forgot to mention is just that, that, you know, that there maybe have was some type of mind altering or mood altering substance abuse yeah. that was occurring. Um, and we've had a couple of really horrific cases like that. There was another one I covered where, well, actually I've covered a number of these on our Patreon where an individual uh, is, is smoking spice or what they were calling K2 or, you know, that all different types of names for this synthetic cannabinoid. The problem with these synthetic cannabinoids, if I'm saying that correctly, I don't know. The problem with them is in a certain subset of the population, I've seen research that claims up to 11% of people who ingest synthetic cannabinoids have some type of mass delusional break, a mm -hmm. psychotic break for with reality temporarily. And that case that you just mentioned, I think was a, a great example of that where an individual entered into such an altered mind state uh, that he was horrified by his own actions. If I remember correctly in that one, yeah. He just is so devastated when he's realizing what he did. And, you, you know, we covered another case where this is a really horrific one. Individual, uh, you know, was smoking spice and um, in this apartment courtyard, dragged his his uh, young baby out into the courtyard and and um, with, you know, stabbed the baby to death with many, many witnesses. And so I did a public data request and pulled all the different 911 calls that were made from these horrified witnesses. And uh, ultimately, what ended up stopping that attack, though it was too late, the, the baby tragically died, was a, a responsible gun owner, saw what was going on, retrieved his, his handgun and shot from a second story balcony, basically uh, hitting the, the kid enough to stop the attack and then you know, police intervened at that point when they arrived, but it's something about the, the mind altering substances as well, that can just throw another really complex variable because the receptors are so different between people. You never yeah. know how your receptors yeah. will respond to those uh, materials when you're introducing them to your body. So that's, those are unfortunate ones, but that's another variable I think that sort of contributes to the potential for something to go horrifically wrong. Yeah. A lot of the undiagnosed mental disorders, like if somebody has something that is a uh, like a mood disorder, like schizophrenia or something like that, and having um, because schizophrenia that is a mood categorized as a mood disorder, isn't it? it? You would think it was like a thought disorder, but yeah, I'm not sure. Or I'm not sure the psychological schizophrenia or anything like that, like a schizoaffective disorder, and you're undiagnosed and you take acid or mushrooms or something like that, and then it's almost like you're entire brain chemistry has changed ultimately forever. Yeah. So it's, it's just wild to sort of think about that being a factor. And it's the sort of like one in, I don't even know what the statistic would be like one in a million chances that that would happen right. to you. But yeah, I mean, think of all the bath salt cases we've oh, heard geez. about in the news where someone sort of becomes a, a proverbial zombie and starts chewing on someone's face. Flash. I mean, really, really horrific things. Uh, yeah. I remember that scare coming out about five, five to 10 years ago where, where right. there, were, there was a lot going on in Florida, specifically uh, several cases where people were just acting deranged in the streets after doing this drug. There was the homeless man. And then there was the couple sitting in their garage. That was two of them. I think there was yeah. another individual, I believe called the police. And when the police arrived, he disemboweled himself. Um, there've been a number. I think the, you know, I think the reason everyone thinks Florida, it was just blown up in Florida, I think is just the, the, the oh, yeah, accessibility. Lawn. Yeah. Everything is so much more accessible statutorily in Florida with the sunshine law and right. other, other uh, local uh, statutes with regard to public data access that mm -hmm. the Florida, the quote, the proverbial Florida man headline is just so common and so comical because uh, the information is just readily accessible yeah. in many cases before anything's been adjudicated in the courts. So, right. Yeah. Stuff like that happens in the South, definitely in the Midwest and, you know, all yeah, over. sure. If you look, addiction's a real issue. Yeah. Um, you know, probably, uh, I, I think I read somewhere that something like 85 to 90% of, uh, of perpetrators of these horrible crimes have some form of substance abuse issue. Um, and that's just terrible. terrible. Yeah. I mean that, that was, a uh, you know, working in the correctional department 
a, that was a major element of programming was substance yes. abuse programming. And that figure sounds about right. I, I want to say about 80 or, or so percent of, of offenders currently incarcerated were, you know, completing some form or type of substance abuse. Well, it just alters, it alters your mind and uh, you're not thinking right. And, um, you know, if you already have a history of uh, psychiatric disorder and stuff like that, those type of drugs uh, are going to alter your brain to be, uh, you know, doing things that you normally wouldn't do. Uh, if it's for the drug, that's one thing. Uh, but sometimes the drug just makes you think entirely different and, and you're not, uh, you're not really capable of handling real life situations properly. And, uh, yeah. But it's it's good that people are being more open and transparent about mental health nowadays, just yeah. because back, you know, even in, you know, the 1950s and 60s, you were either crazy or you weren't. And now it's, you know, there's a little bit more of a, of a spectrum to go off of. And I think that that's, that's good. And it's also, you know, helping people with addiction, sort of understand what's going on there. And I think, you know, yeah. not just having that black and white line dividing good and evil nowadays just talking about mental health and mental health problems in general is a good thing yeah i was i was going to bring up a little bit about um not not specifically russ mccamey but uh you know especially once we started talking into the psychology and potential damage or uh dangers to the public um when it comes to mccamey manor and uh right. water. i just uh i'll have a i'll have a coat can you grab me one I really love that episode. I uh, I thought you did a very good job, and you were very fair. You didn't uh, you didn't come out and 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 sort of speak like some of the other podcasters have uh, when they're when they're talking about check out this weirdo. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right? Because he seems like a very likable guy. That Russ McCamey, uh, you know, a, a guy that uh, not necessarily a likable guy, but a but a guy who presents himself well uh, to people he's speaking to until until you cross this certain uh, this certain point with him, and then it sort of starts getting a little bit different. Uh, I've heard There's been a few things that we we've seen, like um, him sort of making those videos about. Um, you know, people that have tried to sue him and stuff and he kind yeah, of right. is trolling them on the videos and it's like, yeah. yeah, it's funny and everything, but just the look on his face and in his eyes, it's just to me. And maybe that's just because of what he does, but his eyes look so dead yeah. to me. <laughs> it kind of freaks me out a little bit. Yeah. The, I mean, so you, so there was a lot more of Russ McCamey on YouTube, uh, but a lot of that content, you know, he had these really, well-produced videos that he made uh of his haunting you know of his quote-unquote haunt days from when he was living in southern california san diego i believe i don't recall exactly where but again this is a guy who's been profiled on netflix shows you know yeah. every every halloween his name hits the headlines because it's the infamous haunted house you know with a twenty thousand dollar prize if you can survive all the way to the end what people don't realize with russ mccamey and, you know, you mentioned the videos where he's trolling people who are threatening lawsuits and things like that. The Russ is a pretty intelligent guy, I'll say, all things considered. For sure. One of the things we did in that uncensored episode, we kind of systematically went through his uh, extremely lengthy uh, waiver of liability form. Uh, basically, the guy gets you to agree that you, he is not responsible for anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, he also sort of can put you in a legally compromising position where even if you quote unquote say, I'm done, there's a very specific protocol to quote unquote exit the manor. And, uh, you know, he's also cleverly layered these other elements of what have been used historically and what people have called or referred to as mind control programs. Mm -hmm. The primary one being sleep deprivation. Uh, he also claims to have used uh, elements of hypnosis to make people think that their fingernails are being pulled off or that their eyeballs are being uh, impaled with uh, sharp objects and things like that. But I think in the reality is he, he deploys uh, a couple of things very strategically. Number one, uh, at least a day and a half to two days, uh, if I'm interpreting correctly, of outright sleep deprivation before yeah. you, can, you can get to the manor 
followed by uh, extremely and excessively intense physical exercise. He's breaking down the mind. He's he's yeah. he's also breaking down the physical body, which further breaks down the mind, which I think elevates and magnifies the horror of these little things that he does where he yeah. straps you down in a, a metal cage and the only thing sticking above the metal cage is your nose and part of your mouth and he fills it up to the to the brim with water it's a really there are just some really horrifically scary things that you have to imagine if you're sleep deprived to the tune of 24 to 48 hours okay. and you're physically exhausted after you know doing excessive heavily weighted activities out in his yard before you start the, the manor, you begin to see why, uh, you know, his uh, claim to fame that no one has ever made it. No one ever will is true because he will not let anyone make it. it. It's rigged. It's, yeah. it's totally rigged. I think in that episode and correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't listened to it or revisited it in some time, but I believe I included the example of the former Navy seal. Yep. Who, uh, and the adrenaline junkie friend. Right. And the adrenaline junkie friend. And he had these guys, man, soaking wet and in a walk in freezer style uh, room. And uh, what did he do? He basically facilitated hypothermia in both gentlemen and then said, I got to I got to medically stop both you guys. And the Navy SEAL is just like, no, I'm good to go. I'm good to go. You know, and you have to imagine the level of buds training and everything else that this individual has gone through where they've used cold water exposure, hypothermia, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. He's been through that before. And so for an individual like Russ McCamey to call a medical stop, when you get someone of that caliber in, he'll never let anyone win. He'll always find a way out. Uh, and that's yeah. part of the, that's part of the, the horror of it. I, I think that I'm, I, I think there's just something deeply concerning about Russ. Uh, I'm trying yeah. to get, I'm trying to get out there. I'm trying to get out there and talk to him and, I, I, I'm really concerned. Uh, you know, I, I'm obviously concerned with a lot of the things he said and, and what he does, but, uh, I was also very concerned with the internet components of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, him, him telling them that it's being transmitted live, uh, to places right. in Vegas and, and overseas. And that seems almost like if they're, if they're talking about Vegas, like he's doing it so people can like take bets or something weird like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's I mean, he, I think he's exploitative all the way around uh, by the sounds of things. And it's very concerning. Like he's, play, he's playing up the, the possibility that this is a dark yes. web red room, mm -hmm. you know, yes. that you're about to be tortured to death. And and I don't think, I don't think, uh, in fairness, I don't think Russ, uh, to his credit, like I said, he sits down and makes you read verbatim that entire yep. 20 plus page agreement size seven font single spaced and he he gets you in various mediums to uh, access you know basically waive all forms and elements of liability so that he is free and clear to engage with you at these different levels and he does that when they're, you're sleep deprived too he like, does like, yeah they're already people are already sleep deprived and that's the thing is like when you're that sleep deprived like your reference level is already shifted. Like your defenses are down. Like, I don't know if you've ever had like, a, like one or two bad night sleeps in a row or you like drank too much and then you wake up the next day and you're just like super sensitive feeling. He's and making them dress very, very weird too. And, and self-deprecating. Uh, so know, these clothing. are, yeah, these are all elements again of, of historical military quote unquote mind control programs. The yeah. introducing the element of humiliation is a very particular concept the u.s military and other militaries abroad um have been deploying for several decades yeah uh through you know different mechanisms of of um you know bodily humiliation and things like that uh th there's something that happens when you humiliate someone and the 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 way he's doing it now is you know when he's ca he's categorizing and cataloging your sleep deprivation by anyone who's going to the manor now has to log into the McCamey Manor private group and go live like every half hour, two hour. And they have to do these embarrassing things where they eat this horrific concoction of, of uh, disgusting things that makes them vomit, or they have to go walk through Walmart in a, in a bunny onesie while singing songs aloud. You know, he's very strategically introducing elements of humiliation. There's something that happens to the psyche after enough sleep deprivation uh, heavy exercise exposure and humiliation 
uh, you become very malleable. And I think that's the quote unquote hypnosis that he thinks he's engaging in. There's just something more pragmatic about what's actually happening, happening in those cases. And that is he's breaking someone down and, right. uh, and not allowing them to have much control of their environment. And that's sort of what we were talking about where I, I sort of text blasted you about this. Um, but when, um, it's almost like he is disguising something, um, that is not hypnosis as hypnosis, right? Because knowing a fair amount about hypnosis myself, I, um, you can't actually make somebody believe something that they don't want to. Believe. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's a cop out. I, I think he's doing that in case someone comes out and says they were doing these horrible things to me. He can kind of create that realm of, of, of fiction to the public and say you know it wasn't like that just in in the similar way that he does when he talks about his actors uh in quotations and uh now i heard that he's not doing that anymore it's just right. kind of him but um the, you know. ultimately like i said you can't make someone believe something that they're not open to the suggestion of like it's just impossible you can't do that you have to be open to the suggestion to even right. believe what they're saying so when he says he makes people think that they've lost their fingernails or he's gouging their eyeballs out or something like that, um, part of that, if it does work, has to do with the participant wanting that to be what's happening, if it truly is hypnosis. Does that make sense? So what he would be doing is almost like it's not even like a forced hypnosis. It's it's suggestibility through sleep deprivation where you're not in your normal state of mind right. in which no licensed hypnotist would ever hypnotize someone under those parameters. Right. There's a particular level of assumed vulnerability in those st states, I think, that, you know, where certain protections ought to be afforded. I yeah. think the, you know, the hypnosis thing is really, I got, I got a funny story. So I was, you know, maybe, maybe 15, 16 years old and, and this uh, stage hypnotist came to town in uh, Western Wisconsin where we were living. And uh, it was me, my dad and my brother, we all needed, we were, we were going through some stressful family stuff, health related, and uh, we all needed a night out. So my dad got us tickets to this hypnosis show. And you're absolutely right. Uh, me, my dad, and my brother were part of a very large group who volunteered to go on stage. And they sort of introduced a series of different, uh, you know, commands or, or sleep protocol and, and sort of each layer, they filter out the people who are not clearly not open to suggestion, right? That's right. exactly how stage hypnotists do it. They take a big group and then they whittle it down to the most right. people that are most willing to accept the suggestions. So I ended up in the final group, but what, <laughs> but what happened to me is I, I, there was such a social or, or like group pressure for me to do these little things. Like they were like, okay, now, you're at the club, you're dancing, you know, and then it's like, and then I'm just like in my own head, I'm like, fuck. <sighs> so I start dancing, knowing full well, like I am in this position now where I felt like I was already too invested. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just, and I, and I wonder how much of that is quote unquote hypnosis because I certainly didn't feel hypnotized. Well, were, it is hypnosis because you did it and you accepted the suggestion and you danced. Right. So it got to the point where he also, you know, created some trigger like he was gonna you know they had to play this bell noise through the auditorium and uh mine was whenever this bell noise rang out i just i had the sudden urge to go to the bathroom i'd forgotten about this command and so <laughs> when the bell noise rang out i was sitting there and the lights come on and everyone's looking at me and i'm like and my brother was like you have to go pee and i was like oh and you know what i mean so it was like for me it was like ah, i was still playing along with it all the way through the show but you know, there's openness to suggestion, and then there's also a social pressure. And I think one of the reasons he's tapping into the live on social media is to create a social pressure to push oneself further into the proverbial and literal mud in this case in his rural Tennessee property now uh, than they otherwise might. And uh, I, he's very intentional and he's very uh, intelligent in the way he does it. I gotta, I have to give the man some credit. There's nobody else that I know of every Halloween who gets as much free media exposure as wow. Russ McCamey in the McCamey Manor. That uh, is true. Can, can we call back real fast to the fact that him being in rural Tennessee, rural Tennessee is terrifying. Right. Yeah. People still think, man, and they see these videos on YouTube and they think of a traditional haunt, like they're walking through a quote unquote haunted house to be scared. 
that's not what you're walking into. You're, you're climbing into a, an old uh, chest re, uh, freezer that's been filled with muddy water and God knows what else uh, while you're handcuffed and uh, you're, you're repeatedly dunked under the water. You know what I mean? In rural Tennessee yeah. where nobody else is around. And it kind of makes me think, and we had re-listened to the episode the other day, back to like real fast, the adrenaline junkie guy. He, his sort of testimony was a little bit alarming to me in the sense of a you could hear it in his voice and then b him talking about all of the stuff that you see on youtube that they try to get you to do to come here is not an accurate representation of what happens when you're yeah, here it, it's it, almost like it's a ploy to get you to come here as being like it's not as bad as it actually is you could you could legitimately hear in his voice that this was more than like i was scared and i survived this was actually like the same type of response uh, that his body was making as if he got into a car accident and somehow survived. And I or something. So I, I fully believe that he's triggering within these individuals a, a, a very literal near death like experience. Yeah. And, and to hear the terror when there's he, he always kind of does the video debrief afterwards, right, where people are just like eyes are wide and in many cases you know there's blood coming down their nose or they yeah. you know they're missing eyelashes or what have you uh because he used to get really rough i don't know that he does anymore apart from he he has you do some excessively rough physical activity to exhaust you um from what i gather but again he's also been very protective of what he allows to be captured on video and so there are some you know quote unquote exposing mckamey manor videos on youtube that show some of that excessive, exhausting physical activity he may have you do for six hours before you start the manor. Um, he knows what he's doing. No one's ever going to make it through there. I'm sure they wouldn't put full-on waterboarding on the videos either. But even though we know that that's probably what's happening, there there have been so many accounts of of them doing that. But yeah, I think you know. I frankly, I think it's kind of a small miracle that someone. I don't remember. I don't know if someone did. Did someone die there? I don't remember. Did someone have some heart issues and like have a I, heart attack? I think somebody, I, I'm, it may have been McKamey Manor, but I think someone, I, no one died, but I think someone did have something happen with the heart. I, yeah. I think the same one. You know, I, I think it's a miracle. You know, no one has died. I think it's, it's, uh, but again, I, I also, I, I can't quite put my finger on it because there's still a mysterious curtain. He's like the wizard of Oz. Like you yeah, hear, you hear and thing. see what he wants you to hear and see, but he's doing things behind the curtains. Like, and, and no, none of us quite know what that is unless you've been there, unless you've uh, tried to take on the manor. So well, and even with the legalities of his contract, uh, if someone did die in that manner, if he was committing a crime, it would still be, uh, it would be an invisible in a court of law, wouldn't it? I mean, he, he would uh, certainly and could be found negligent in his yeah. uh, carrying out those activities and facilitating those on his property, which I think is why even in even on the rural Tennessee property, he's been bounced around a little bit. I think some of the property yeah. owners have said, ah, we really don't want you doing this stuff. Yeah. Whatever well, people, you're doing over people here. People were like <laughs> trying to run away and he was he was getting them in the right. middle of the street and stuff. And and that, oh, the cops have been called a lot. Yeah, by the sounds yeah. of it, from people looking like they're running from a, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre film yeah. uh, scene. You know what I mean? Shows up on his neighbor's doorstep and is like, "I just really need a cup of sugar." And you're, man, you know, I, I'm going to need I, you to get I off would, my property, yeah. <laughs> like right now. Right. I wouldn't give him an egg. I, sure. I mean, I would definitely be open to like talking to him in general. You know, just to see, you know, what makes him tick and just the background of McKamey Manor and you know what he thinks it is that he's doing. But going through the manor, no, sorry, no way, never. It's too far. <laughs> it's too far. Yeah, he, you know, and that's part of the allure. I think uh, he's also playing into human ego uh, by creating a, a, by creating a, an unscalable mountain. In this case, he's he's strategically put all these parameters in place. The allure yeah. of the alleged twenty thousand dollar prize contradicted by the fact that he will explicitly tell you no one will ever make it through and uh and frankly he will make sure of that as we've seen and the uh and the the contract itself actually uh kind of lays all of that out anyways uh, it says right in there that uh even if they beg to get out of it uh that they're they're 
you know, forced to continue basically by their own, by their own signature on this document. So it's like, no matter what, there isn't a safe word. All of that stuff is just sort of, uh, Interviewing people as to why they chose to go, I think, would be an interesting thing to do. Yeah. That, like, as a topic, like trying to get a hold of people and say, not just like, what was your experience necessarily, but like, what, why did you want to do this? I tried. Yeah, I tried. <laughs> I figured I, you did. I tried excessively. Now, let me lay this out there. There's also an element of non-disclosure agreement built into these these liability waivers that he's having folks sign. There's a there's a, you know. People are, you know, legally by virtue of having signed this contract or agreement, legally shouldn't be sharing their experience beyond what he's permitting during that debrief when he's filming it himself and has control over what gets released. I almost was able to talk to one of his former actors who I found by a little bit of independent web sleuthing. I, was, I, I love this story because in the video that has the actual, I'm pretty sure it's the one with the, with the adrenaline junkie and the former Navy SEAL. One of his actors is a younger woman. And uh, if I remember correctly, she's got like a purple smartwatch band. And she's, you know, she's got some type of really early smartwatch. And uh, she's got a, she's wearing one of the onesie things or whatever you call those, like the actors did in, in like the, the participants did. And uh, at, Time, different times during the video, I would freeze frame it and I was trying to see physical identifying features of his actors' faces. And then I was, once I had been accepted to the private group, I was going through every member of the several thousand member group and, and going through their Facebook profiles, trying to find one of his actors. And I did. I found that young woman and I matched the exact purple smartwatch. And once I saw the features of her face, I wrote her a message on Facebook. And I said, hey, I came across this video on YouTube. I realize this is probably a little concerning. That I'm writing <laughs> you out of the blue. But I have reason to believe you are one of Russ McCamey's, quote, actors. I would love to talk to you on the record about a podcast episode I'm producing right now. And I almost had her convinced to, to talk with me. But she was afraid of legal ramifications of whatever agreements he had with his actors and in him being able to come after her in some Man, capacity. So he's got that thing airtight. He's got to have. He really does. He really does. And I think, you know, even part of that liability waiver, 95% uh, of it's uh, a dog and pony show. It's to intimidate yeah. an individual because there, there are some horrific things in there. Like you, you are agreeing to, if, if requested, pull out your own teeth or, you know, Dan's Nova gain. Right, right. And part of the process of him having you read that verbatim while you're sleep deprived and about to engage in exhaustive physical exercise before he used to begin laying his hands on you, or he did at that point, even in those videos, I think is to, it, it's all part of that mind game. He is literally uh, tearing down every defense anyone comes in with and, and sort of breaks you down to, to baseline and then begins having his way with you, which is uh, terrifying. It's also, it's interesting to think of that a lot of those practices are sort of like, or the sort of setup to go to the manor are kind of what people that run sort of cults do. But yeah. it's it's almost like that there's, there's, there's no hook to get you to stay there because it's t torture. So it's like, it, it's... He does, he does have groups, though. Uh, I've heard horror stories of the groups, uh, people doxing people, things like that. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty out of control in those groups. Yeah. But. Yeah, I'm still a member. I mean, I'm still a member of the main private group. And uh, there's definitely a groupthink element. Part of what used to happen as well is he would have certain young women that sort of became part of his personal life. And they would sort of become moderators of the group. There were yeah. a couple of individuals who I won't name here that uh, allegedly were, you know, developed a relationship with him and sort of were living on the property or on the compound. Right. So when you I'm not saying there are elements of a, of a cult there, I think it's something on a, on a very micro scale, but there are elements of that same type of collective groupthink and quote unquote mind control that a lot of cult leaders tap into. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, definitely. Uh, and some of those uh, and some of those folks have come out publicly on YouTube against him. If you dig. Yeah. Come in after the fact and just be like, wait a minute. 
that was horrible. <laughs> it's so not to laugh about it, but it's just, it's so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous, you know? And I, and you're right. And when we were talking about it the other day, it's like there, there is something about it that just isn't quite right, but we don't know what it is. Well, we know what it is. We recognize. Right. I guess the dangers, I mean with I Russ suppose. in yeah. general. Yeah, I agree. Well, we're not going to, we're not going to keep you much longer. Uh, we just, you know, really want to thank you for, for doing this interview with us and, uh, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of, uh, a lot of big, deep subjects that we were going to bring up. We just wanted to have a nice open discussion with you about, uh, about your podcast and get some people listening to you from, from our side of the, the internet. Yeah. Anything you want to plug that's coming up or, uh, any cases that you, uh, you feel you want to look into in the future that you want to throw out there or. No, you know, I mentioned previously and you brought up, you know, this uncensored series that we're working on right now. It is, it's behind our premium Patreon paywall, Yeah. but we're working on a case right now with, you know, sort of diving into what, who some have called the infamous Reddit cat killer, Lady Iris, this, this oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Reddit user who uh, has posted some horrific detailed torture and murder fantasies. And this is kind of a natural extension of the series that I just did. Uh, over the last six to eight months on the gore community, individuals mm -hmm. who spend several hours per day watching horrifically gory material on the internet and looking at some of those cases specifically. This individual, I think, not only claims to possess these extremely aggressive and, and horrific homicidal ideations, you know, they've, they've also admitted having uh, access to children, desiring of having their own children, but also it, it also happens to be that uh, a central tenet of their fantasy involves the exploitation or harming of children, yes. or torturing or murdering children. And so I've been, uh, you know, I've been doing some deeper dive ethnography work, if you will. Uh, I found this woman. Um, you did find her. I did find her. Uh, a listener identified her. I have verified that now. Um, and so there's much coming out in the next several weeks in this case in particular, Looking including, including, I think, um, some, some very real evidence that may lead to a criminal prosecution in this case, because wow. there are other, there are also some really horrific elements of animal cruelty that she's admitted to. And yeah. so part of what I've been trying to do is build trust, build a relationship with this individual to the extent that I can also, uh, gather enough literal physical evidence related to the claims that have been made to uh, hopefully you know lead to a meaningful intervention on behalf of law enforcement so who knows this is some of the most fascinating stuff i've done and i think it's been our most engaging series yeah it, um, it really and that's sort of what made me want to reach out to you initially with about that and from the time that we were on the last podcast that you did about it i remember sort of where we were at was like um we were kind of trying to figure out what her reasoning was for continuing to converse with you. Cause it seemed sort of not in her best interest. Do, do you feel like you have a better understanding of that at this point? You don't have to go into the details, but. I do. Um, you know, that was one of the things in my last interview with this woman, um, I spoke with her for over three hours, uh, face to face, much like we are. Uh, so she's no longer hiding behind the, uh, cloak of anonymity wow. um, and she also i haven't i've not yet confronted her with the i with the fact that i actually know her true identity uh but i will be doing so soon she does know uh that a listener has identified her um i just haven't actually said the name as mu much to her dismay um but i will at some point so you know th this one is I'm not trying to draw people to our to our premium channel, uh, but it, it is just some of the most fascinating content and sort of quote unquote investigative work I've ever done. Uh, but it's also brought me into some really weird places in these interviews. Yeah. Uh, and then in the next couple of episode parts that are coming out on on Patreon, um, we're diving into some uh, extensive we're revealing the true morbid fascination this individual has with animal cruelty. And we've said in this episode, there's often a transition from fantasy to reality. And that involves animal cruelty about in this area before they get to the literal torturing and murdering of an individual. And uh, I believe this individual is truthful. This is not an internet troll. 
Me too. I, I also believe this individual is and and uh, and likely will uh, commit a horrific uh, crime one day. And so this is an opportunity for us to intervene and to engage our listeners. Like I said, a listener made the identification. I have not disclosed that yet. So, you know, spoiler alert here. Um, for legal reasons, we're, we're uh, proceeding very carefully because there are peripheral victims here as well. Uh, yeah. Family, yeah. husband, et cetera, uh, whose yeah. life we do not want to uh, inadvertently ruin in the process. So it's new territory for sure. I'll, I'll cut that off right there. So just off the record, we're not, we won't include this. Was it somebody that knew her? You don't have to tell me like who, it, what her name is or anything. I'm just saying, was it somebody that knew her or is it somebody that was just did sleuthing? No, it's a, it's a graduate student who took a very pragmatic, literal approach using the things that she disclosed during our episodes to find her. I mean, it's a really, and I actually interviewed the woman who I, who made the identification and I had, I had her run me through. Uh, the process she, how she did it yeah how she did it and, that's what uh, i love about your your podcast and your investigative work you uh you just deal with it in such a such a responsible um a responsible way and you, you go over the evidence the way a good investigator does and uh you're not you're not easily bullshit there's um, so many people that are irresponsible it, ma it makes me just not want to do it anymore you know what i mean it's just yeah it's so we've, we've been struggling with it because, uh, you know, I don't even really want to be connected to a group of people who uh, harm victims and stuff like that. And it seems a lot of content creators are just so um, irresponsible. And, you know, on the Internet, it's a it's a pretty harsh place. You get people hiding behind their keyboards. They get to hide their identity. So they say a lot of horrible things to you, uh, you know, criticize you because you're kind of putting yourself out there and. Right. So it's put a lot of pressure on our lives to to continue with this. But at the same time, uh, I believe you, uh, like us, are, are fighting the good fight for a lot of these victims. And, uh, you know, your heart's in the right place. Just guard that heart. And uh, yeah, I you know, the bigger you get, uh, the more people you reach, the yeah. more of that vitriol and uh, negativity yep. comes out of the woodwork, I would say on a weekly basis. I probably get, you know, 10 to 20 hate emails, you know, five to know. 10 uh, DMs of people who are literally just going out of their way to engage with a, with a content creator in a very just negative way. Yeah. Um, and so I struggle with that same stuff. You know, there isn't a day well, of the feels, week where it feels I don't very personal, away. right? Like you, you it know, does. we're we're kind of concerned uh, with with these subjects in a very personal and in a heartfelt way. And when someone comes up and starts doing this stuff, we, you know, this is very close to our heart. And um, it's easy for someone that just sort of seasonally yeah. looks at this stuff to just right. like jab you right in the heart about that. And it's it like he said, it, it feels personal, but it's, you know, people have no shame. The Internet's the Wild West. and They don't really understand that you're a real person with feelings. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. Keep keep fighting the good fight, brother. And uh, you know, thanks a lot for coming on our on our podcast and talking to us. And uh, you know, hopefully we can get some listeners over to your end of things, and uh, you know, we can uh, collaborate in the future. I think it'd be great. So yeah, I, and and thank you both for the opportunity. Obviously, we connected for this uncensored, uh, torturous teacher sort of yeah. you know, this Reddit cat killer case. I love the opportunity to collaborate. Uh, you guys have offered some fantastic insight, uh, which we'll be covering in part three coming up. Nice. And uh, man, I love the work that you're doing. And I I know we didn't talk about Delphi. It's it's not a case for me that I'm exceptionally familiar with. Yep. Um, but, but having looked through some of the materials and things that you guys have out there right now, uh, I, I think you're doing great work. And I think we need to uh, continue to tap into you know, this collective, uh, we've seen how it can be at times destructive, sort of the mm -hmm. independent web sleuthing or independent investigative model. But I also think we're seeing more and more how productive uh, a, a contribution it actually represents in more and more cases as more yes. and more people are living their lives through the Internet, through their digital and electronic uh, identities. So keep up the good work likewise there, too. And, and, uh, and thank you both for inviting me on. I had a good time. Yeah. yeah, everybody go subscribe to, listen to Invisible Choir. Um, all of the 
pro tears are worth it. I promise. I look forward to your podcast every week. I get a little boost of serotonin every time I see it come up on my updated for my podcast. So Excellent. it's been an Thank honor. You. And yeah, we look forward to talking with you in the future. All right. Sounds good. Have a great night. All right. You too there, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you.